a letter to a church in one of the most influential cities of the ancient world. From the most influential apostle ever known. A man who had never even met many of the believers to whom he wrote. This letter lays the foundation for their faith, for our faith, and explains how a people entrapped in sin and slavery could be reconciled to the perfect, just, and righteous God of the universe. This letter that became a biblical book that has shaped church history perhaps more than any other. This is Paul's letter to the Romans. Well, good morning, North Point. Uh, So good to see you this morning. And, um, you know, I was just thinking uh, about what an opportunity it is for us uh, to be able to do this, you know, to be able to come together um, every single week and kind of like reset and refocus. What is life about? What am I doing here? God, do you have you know, something for me. And so through um, the worship that we do together, uh, through being able to take communion together with each other, uh, being able to open God's word and to hear from him together, uh, uh, together fixing our eyes on Jesus and what's really important is such a blessing and a privilege that God gives to us. And so um, whatever state you we're in, when you came into this place this morning, which is kind of all over the map, I imagine. Um, some of you maybe just got back from spring break last night at midnight. I know some of you did or you drove. We drove 24 hours over the last two days to get back home. We're like, we're probably not going to do that trip again. You know, driving and all of this. And so we're back here and it's like, God, I need to see you. Where are you at? we got a week coming up ahead of us. We're tired. Some of you, you, you know, you come into this place this morning and you're just, you're dealing with stuff. Um, struggles, trials, difficulty, hurts, just issues that are going on, and you need the reset, you need the refocus, you need to see Jesus. Um, Some of you come into this place and you're like, I'm excited, I'm happy, I'm positive, I'm celebrating, I'm an Iowa State fan. You know, so like I am celebrating a big, you can clap for that, that's fine, yeah. Uh, Okay, that was very timid, very timid, you know. Celebrate a Big 12, you know, tournament championship and maybe an NCAA championship too. I don't know. Maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves, but we'll see how that goes. But uh, just whatever state you're in, wherever you come in to this place, just receive uh, and hear from God, receive this opportunity to together, together to fix our eyes on, on Jesus together. So I, I want to help us do that uh, through God's word this morning. And so we're, we're, we're rolling through Romans now. I mean, we're, we're rolling now. We were like one year in Romans chapter one, and we're already now in Romans chapter three after a couple weeks. So take your Bibles if you have it and turn to Romans uh, chapter three. It's at page 912 in those chair Bibles. And let me tell you where we're at. We've been looking at uh, Paul, who's writing this, his argument here um, that God is holy, that God is righteous, that he is perfect in every single way. He is good but all humans are unrighteous. Now, unrighteous in different ways, maybe. Um, There are those that are unrighteous that that really forget God and say no to God and kind of give God the middle finger. I'm gonna do life my own way. God, I don't care about you. Uh, So that's one way to be unrighteous. But another way Paul picks up on that we can be unrighteous is that we could be moral rule followers who have pride in our name and our status and our behaviors and our lifestyles because we do the right things and we are the right kind of people. And what Paul actually says in Romans chapter one and two is, it doesn't matter which way you're unrighteous, we're all unrighteous, right? The rebellious and the people that are moral rule followers, we're all far from God because no one of us can be perfectly righteous. None of us can be righteous like God is righteous. We all sin, we just happen to sin in different ways. Now that though creates a problem for us because God is judging and he will judge through his wrath all unrighteousness which is in everybody, which means we're all accountable before God. So what you realize that Paul is trying to do in these first three chapters of Romans is to help us see how truly desperate we are, that every single person is in a desperate situation. Now, sometimes in Christian theology we try to make sure we say, hey, uh, all people are equal in that they are given the image of God and every single human being being has incredible worth and value. Absolutely true, we don't wanna miss that. But there's also another way that every single human being is equal, we're equal in our sinfulness, right, before God, and our unrighteousness before God, and are gonna suffer under the wrath of God. That's what Paul's saying, and he's trying to get us to this place where we're all equally desperate 
and we realize how desperate we are before God so that he can bring us the solution, the answer to our desperation. And so what Paul's trying to do is something like this. It's like we're all trapped out in the desert, completely parched. We've been out in the desert for days, sun beating down upon us by day, freezing cold at night, no water, no food, lips cracked, throat dry, stomach aches, and you begin to realize to yourself, if I don't get rescued, I'm gonna die. You've heard stories about this, right? People hiking like in the mountains or some national park and they get off of the trail. Um, I read a story about a guy that um, one time was actually doing an ultra marathon in the Sahara Desert. You know, mistake number one probably, but ultra marathon in the Sahara Desert, a sandstorm comes up, he gets off of the trail, and for nine and a half days he's wandering around in the Sahara Desert thinking that he is gonna die until he finally gets rescued. Welcome to Romans. Like this is what Paul is doing for us in Romans when you read through these first three chapters. You've gotta see how desperate you are so that we can find the solution. Now, we're about to get to the rescue part, but we've got a little bit of desert first. Can we handle just a little bit uh, more, de- two more weeks of desert, and then we're gonna get to the rescue part. And so what I wanna do as we get into chapter three is explain these first eight verses and then give us a couple of applications uh, from this. Now, the text we look at today, a little bit more desert, follows after Paul's challenge to the Jewish people who tended to fall a little bit more into the moral superiority category. Not tended to fall a little bit more. They fell into the moral superiority category. And so for a lot of Jewish people, they're like, we are the chosen people of God. We have the law, we have been circumcised, we are good. And Paul says, no, you are not good. You have all of those things, but they don't have you. You haven't let God truly have you and have a relationship with you. And so instead you rely on your history and you rely on the law and you rely on your name and you rely on all these external signs of religion, but you actually break the law that you find pride in. We have the law. It's like, but you don't even follow the law. You break the law. And then he says this outrageous thing at the end of chapter two that would make any good Jewish person's blood absolutely boil. Check it out in chapter two, verse 28. He says, a person is not actually a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who's one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit of God, not just about the written code. In other words, being born a Jew and having all of the outward signs of the Jewish religion and all of those expressions, they don't really matter that much so much so that Gentiles could actually be true Jews because God has always been after something deeper. He's been after the spiritual over the physical. As John, as he taught through this passage in chapter two last week, he said it this way. It's not just about the invitation we get from God. The invitation we get from God is amazing, but you've gotta respond to the invitation, right? You gotta go to the party. You gotta engage in the relationship with the God that has invited you in. It's about relationship with him. So many of the Jewish people, they missed out on actually being the chosen people of God and Gentiles, non-Jewish people, they became the chosen people. Now, it might be hard to grasp how truly offensive this would be to Jewish people, what Paul is saying there at the end of chapter two. Um, So so maybe, uh, let me give you an illustration. Imagine, you've heard of this, um, there's this basketball player, this girl that plays, I think she plays for Iowa. Have you heard of this person? There, uh, Caitlin Clark is her name. Have you, I don't know if you've heard about her. So yeah, I gave Iowa State a shout out. So here, Iowa, you get your shout out too uh, today. And so um, Caitlin Clark is a, is a decent basketball player. Um, a, a number of, um, a couple of years ago, we were actually at an event that was sponsored by hy V, and our middle daughter, who's played a lot of basketball, she got to meet Caitlin, and this was just when Caitlin was like famous, not like famous, 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 like almost Taylor Swift famous. She was still like just kind of famous. And so uh, we got to meet her, there wasn't a lot of people around, and Quinn got to shoot baskets with her. Surprisingly, Caitlin did not miss one shot, you know, very casually just throwing them up there, switched every shot, you know, that she, that she took, but it was fun and Quinn got her autograph and we got to spend a little bit of time with her. It was, it was kind of fun. But could you imagine me going up to Caitlin Clark and saying to her, you know what? I don't think you're that great. I'm pretty sure I could take you one-on-one. I mean, look at you, you're a girl after all, right? I mean, 
I'm a guy, like I could certainly, you know, like take you. I mean, one time when I was, uh, Michelle and I, when we were younger and we were leading a college ministry, me with a group of guys, we played Valparaiso girls basketball team and we beat them. And so I'm like, come on, we can do this. I could take you, Caitlin Clark. Now, Caitlin would probably look at me and just laugh it off, right? She's just like, okay, bro, uh, whatever. Like, let's move on. But could you imagine how offensive that would be if I truly meant that? Oh, you're, you're a girl. I could certainly take you. That kind of level of offense and even beyond that is is what the Jewish people are feeling, right? When Paul says, I don't think you're really truly Jewish. You're not really the chosen people of God if you haven't embraced who God is and a relationship with him. Now that offended the Jewish people so much because Many Jewish people didn't even believe that Gentiles could have a relationship with God, much less have a closer relationship to God than they had, that the Gentiles were actually getting it right while the Jews got it wrong. So at this point, while the offense meter is maxing out, Paul anticipates some of the Jewish people kind of lobbying a a cacophony of questions at him, arguments that they would, retorts that they would come back at him. Now, now John told us last week that probably here, Paul is having a kind of a rhetorical conversation with an imaginary Jewish person. And that conversation continues here as Paul anticipates objections that the Jewish people might have to what he's saying. And so the objections go like this. Well, Well, Paul then, in your estimation, is there no point being Jewish? There's no good to being Jewish. There's no advantage to that. Why would God even make us his people? And that's what Paul begins to address in chapter three. So check out this text and see what Paul says there about these arguments Jewish people might have. Verse, chapter three, verse one. What advantage then, Paul says, is there in being a Jew? What value is there in circumcision? Now if that question was asked after what Paul's just said, what do you imagine Paul might say? There isn't an advantage, right? There's there's not really an advantage in being Jewish. There's not an advantage in circumcision. That's not what he says. Look at what he says. He goes, verse two, much, there is an advantage in every way to circumcision and to being Jewish. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. So he says, no, 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 don't don't get me wrong. This was a part of God's plan. This is what God was doing. And if you were Jewish and you were part of the chosen people of God, like that's a really good thing. First of all, and he doesn't go second of all, so he's probably saying the biggest thing is that the Jewish people had the very words from God. That's a really big deal. And then he goes on. Verse three, well, what if some of those Jewish people were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? In other words, Those Jewish people being unfaithful, doesn't that really mean God's unfaithful because this was his plan in the first place? And if they screwed it up, isn't it really that God that's unfaithful and he screwed it up? Verse four, Paul says, not at all, of course not. Let God be true and every human being a liar. He says, God is true, you know. I'm Jewish, you're Jewish, we all believe that God is true, that he is right in all of his judgments. Every single human being can speak a false reality. God, though, is true as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. This is a quote from the Psalms. The Psalms saying that God is right when he speaks, he prevails in all of his judgments. Verse five, well, okay, well what if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly? What shall we say about that? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath upon us? In other words, here's another objection. Well, okay, so if this was God's plan and many of the Jewish people didn't follow God's plan and they were unfaithful, might not mean that God's unfaithful, but I guess if that was gonna be a part of the plan, that they would be unrighteous and not follow God's ways, doesn't that like shine a spotlight on how righteous God is? Like the darker they are, the more the light of God shines. So if that's God's plan, how could he judge these people that are unrighteous when he knows that that is going to happen? Isn't God unjust in bringing his wrath upon us? And then Paul realizes that he's kind of going down a route here that's kind of almost ridiculous. And so he says, you see it in parentheses, I'm I'm using a human argument here. I don't really believe this, but I just want you to know I'm using a human way of thinking. And so he answers in verse six, certainly not, no way, God is not unjust in judging us. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Again, remember he's speaking to Jewish people here. And so he says, look, you Jews and me as a Jew, we all believe that God will judge the world. He is, we agree on that. I agree on it, you agree on that, and he is just in judging the world. Verse seven, similar argument, somebody might argue. If my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I condemned as a sinner? Kind of same argument, right? If my unfaithfulness shows that God is still great to accomplish his plan, even if I'm not faithful to it, uh, then why is God condemning me for that? 
why not say, verse eight, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Paul says, I even have got accused of this sometimes. For so teaching about the forgiveness of God through Jesus and the grace that God offers that some have said, well, I guess we should just sin so that God's grace will be magnified even more. Paul says, I've been accused of that. And he says, their condemnation on that is just, it's a ridiculous argument. Now, there's a lot that's going on there, right? And some of you maybe are like, I don't don't follow that. Okay, so let me summarize here. The heart of it is this, if the Jewish people who were by and large unfaithful to God, and they were unfaithful to him. Doesn't that actually mean that God is unfaithful? It was his plan after all, and so their failure is actually God's failure. And even if God used their unfaithfulness to show his faithfulness, like they used their their bad to show his good, how could God judge them for that? Maybe we should just sin like crazy so that God will be seen as even more amazing. The more we sin, the more amazing God will be seen to be. Now. Where that argument devolves at the end, sinning so that God could do more good is almost nonsensical, right? Um, It's kind of akin to a statement that I like to throw around. Um, Sometimes when we go like to the outlet mall and there's a a really good deal, like at the outlet malls, we were just down in Orlando, okay, for spring break, that was our long trip back. And uh, it seemed like the number one thing, I I have a house full of, 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 of ladies, and they like to shop, they enjoy shopping. So we went to two different outlet malls and we hit all of the stores, right? So sometimes when we go to that place, like to justify all the spending that is taking place, I'll say something like, well, the more you spend, the more you save, right? (laughs) Which is, it's kind of true when there's like 50% off or 75% off, the more you spend, the more you do save, that actually is a true statement, right? But also the more you spend, the more you spend, right? The more, the more you're getting rid of. And so this argument here, like sinning, the more I sin, the more I highlight God's goodness, kind of, but it's not really what God has in mind. It's not really what he intended. And that choice that every human being makes to sin separates us from God, it separates us from his righteousness, which is worthy of judgment. The, 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 the quote in verse four, so that you are uh, proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. That's actually from Psalm 51. This is the Psalm of King David when he confesses before God his adultery and his murder of an innocent man. And what David is saying is that even though I was your chosen king, even though I was a man after your own heart, God, I was unfaithful to you, I was unfaithful to your plan, and so you are just in judging me because I'm unrighteous. We as humans are responsible and accountable to God for all of our unrighteous actions. But even if we sin and if we continue to sin, God will be faithful to his plan to save humanity. Humans, with all of our sinfulness, we cannot thwart the plan of God. This is why Paul says, let God be true. True to his word, true to his plan, true to what he has designed. And every human being a liar, every human being unrighteous, No human being truly getting it without God's help, but God is always true. Now look, that little little quote there is a pretty good truth to build your entire life on. That that no matter what other people say, no no matter what other people do, no matter what other people value, no matter what other pressure people put upon me, God is true and every human being doesn't really get it. They don't really know apart from God. You know, one of the commitments that you and I need to make as followers of Jesus as we grow and mature, and hopefully early on, and if not, at some point we gotta get this, we've gotta make this commitment in our lives where we say as a default setting, what does God say about that? What is reality? What is actually true? So um, when you're coming to make a decision, where are you gonna live? What, what career are you gonna go into? You've got a, a dilemma that you have, to, you have to make and you and a close friend or maybe your spouse, you disagree over this thing or you're deciding what kind of entertainment you're going to watch. You're deciding how you're gonna spend your money. You're deciding who you're gonna marry. The first question we always have to ask ourselves in any situation is, what does God say about that? Because let God be true and every human being a liar. That doesn't mean that every human being is always a liar. There's good counsel that can be there, but the point is this, we start with what does God say? What does his word say? And a default setting for us is not, what do I think about this? 
or what do I want or what am I going to do or what would be best for me? Those questions aren't unimportant. You can get to those, but we start with what does God say? And first, maybe we start with this. What has God said about it already? What has he given to us? What is his word and his reality about this? And then, God, what are you speaking to me about? What is your spirit telling me how I apply this truth in this circumstance? Let God be true. And every human being a liar. He is true. And his will will prevail. It will ultimately prevail. Okay? So, how do we know that God's will will prevail? I'm like, how do we know that God accomplished and he is accomplishing his plan? I mean, after all, the the Jewish people were unfaithful. David, who was quoted here from Psalm 51, he was unfaithful. He was supposed to be the deliverer. He's supposed to be the, the, the kind of the king of kings there, the man after God's own heart. And he failed. Did that thwart God's plan? No. In their place, God sent a better king. He sent a better human. He sent the perfect human. God himself came down, Jesus Christ, perfectly God and perfectly human to live, to die, and to resurrect. Romans chapter one, verse 16 and 17, the righteousness from God has been revealed to us, given to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. And so Jesus fulfills the plan of God by bringing us the righteousness of God through faith in him. And in him, God's plan is accomplished. Then those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in God's reality, let God be true, they become his children. They become true Jews, chosen people of God, Jesus' church, living in his righteousness and carrying out his plan on this earth. For those who reject Jesus, they receive the result of their unrighteousness, which is judgment from God. Now, that is the big picture of what Paul is working through here and what he's going to lead us to in the rest of chapter 3 more fully. But what I want to do today is is pick up on two, I'm just going to call them underlying ideas in this passage to explore a little bit more. I tried to give you the main idea of what Paul is getting at here and what he's doing, but sometimes when you're reading the Bible, there's the main idea we always want to try to grasp, but sometimes there's just like a phrase or a statement that you're reading and you're like, huh, that's, that's speaking to me, that, that's doing this. And so as I read through and studied this passage, there was two of those things that it just kind of like, they just gripped me. And I wouldn't say they're the main idea of the passage, but, but they're there and, and I hope maybe they'll grip your heart as well. I mean, it's kind of a little bit like this. We talk about the gospel being a diamond, that as you turn that diamond, there's, a, there's another cut and there's another source of color that is shooting out and there's a beauty as you turn that diamond around. Well, imagine today, sometimes there's a diamond but it's on a necklace and there's like emeralds you know, or rubies that are like around that diamond. So I got, I got a couple of emeralds, okay, for you today to apply from this passage. And, and the first one is this. Paul is going to teach us and show us this, that Christianity goes wrong if it's more about what I get than what I get to be a part of. Christianity begins to go wrong when it's more about what I get than what I get to be a part of. So think about this. Paul points out that the problem for many Jewish people was that their pride and their confidence was in their name, that we are Jewish people, that they received the law, that they got circumcised, that they did all of these outward religious duties. And so they had a sense of superiority and entitlement because they were the right people and they did the right kinds of things. And they looked at all of those signs as signs of God's blessing upon them. It's, it's, it's on me, it's, it's for us, look at us. Everybody else is losers, lamos, wannabes, to quote a popular song, right? That's everybody else, but we are in. Today, for us, this might look like pride and confidence in my religion itself, right? Pride and confidence in my moral goodness. I am better than a lot of other people because I don't do those things, and I do these things, and I'm in the right church. I go to a North Point church, man. Like, I, yeah, come on, right? My pride is in my, I got baptized. I got baptized years and years ago. I got baptized and that was a great thing, but like it's it's, it's about that. I I got baptized in that place. My confirmation, I got the slip of paper. My name is on the confirmation document that I did the things, I know the answers to the questions. I did the thing in front of the church. My pride is in my church attendance. My pride is in that I follow these authors or these internet personalities. 
I, I talked to somebody, a, a fellow a person that's a leader in a church, not even in this state, another state just last week, and they had somebody in their church that said, hey, you know what? We are really, uh, we're gonna have to leave this church because you guys are following, and they had a whole list of heretical people that um, we have most of their books like in our bookstore out here. And like these people are, and you know what they did? They listened to some internet personality and they just went down a rabbit hole of every church and everybody is completely wrong on all of these things and naming a number of these names and they just, our pride is in this one person, personality that we follow that says that all the other personalities and all the other people are wrong, right? It's pride in those kinds of things. I'm a good person, I'm doing the right things, I have the right associations, so God, what blessings are you bringing on me because it's about me? So all of the good things from God and all of the blessings of God, they actually terminate on me, they're about me. I come to church, right? This is really for me. Good vibes and probably a good week because I am the right kind of person doing the right things. Now look, we can exist in that false reality and that false way of thinking which is not an actual relationship with God. And here's how we always know that's wrong and it goes wrong. It always leads to pride and superiority. It always leads to looking down on others. It always leads to me feeling better about myself while kind of smugly looking at others. It's pride and superiority always because it's about the self. It's about me. The other option is to exist in God's reality. And in God's reality, it works more like this. God, thank you that I even get to be a part of what you're doing. Thank you that you've given me life. Thank you for the people that you've put around me. Thank you for my church. Thank you for teaching from your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of me. Thank you for friends that will challenge me when I need to be challenged and they'll love me and they'll say even hard things to me that are for my good. Thank you for people that that pray for me and thank you for people that I can pray with and thank you that I get to serve you. Thank you that I get to talk to other people about you. Thank you for heaven that no matter what happens in this life and how bad my life is and how hard my life might be here in the circumstances of life, there is an eternity waiting with you where Jesus will make everything new. All things will be new. Jesus, you've given me that. Thank you for this. That's verse one and two of chapter three, right? What advantage is there in being a Jew? What value is there in circumcision, the invitation that God's given us to be in his life? Much in every way, there is an advantage to being the people of God. First of all, Paul says here, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Now that's a place of great gratitude, right? That God has given us that. Now now for the Jews here, Paul says, they were entrusted with the words of God, the very words of God, he says, which doesn't just mean the Bible. It doesn't just simply mean the Old Testament. It includes that, but it includes the promises of God. And what are the promises of God? The Old Testament describes those as covenants, covenant commitments that God made with his people that he would save the entire world through them, through them. And so when God chooses Abraham to make the nation of Israel, right, he chooses the special people. This is the foundation of the Jewish people is Abraham, right, who he calls out. He says to Abraham, I'm gonna bless you to make you a blessing, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That plan that God had through Abraham, though many of the Jewish people did not embrace it, that plan did not end with the Jewish people, simply because they were unfaithful. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, it's fulfilled through us. And so now we move from, okay, what do I get out of this? God, what are you doing for me today? How are you gonna bless my life and make my life better? We move from that to thank you, God, for letting me be a part of your plan to save the world. Blessing us to be a blessing. So when I get into that place, and there's a sense of just um, gratitude and thankfulness in my heart, I begin to move then to, let's go. God, what do you have for me to be a part of? What do you have for me to do? We have been entrusted here today, not only with the word of God, but the word of God, Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus who came to redeem the world. So we could maybe, we like to say things positively around here. I don't like negative statements to be on the screen for too long. So let's amend this and make this more positive. We could say it this way. Christianity goes right when I'm grateful for what I get. When I truly am grateful and I see it, and I I don't deny it, and I don't just simply look past it, but I'm grateful for what I get from God, and I'm even more excited for what I get to be a part of. 
grateful for what I get, more excited for what I get to be a part of. Life in God, life with God, salvation, family, heaven, the word of God, the spirit of God, the church of God. We get to take communion together to remember Jesus Christ giving us a relationship with our Father. And so you can start, kind of like concentric circles, start with that with the core of the blessings that God has given to us. But out from those things I just mentioned, you can move on, okay, what's our specific context? And let's just be honest, for those of us that are sitting here today, part of our context is we get to live in a free country. You get to live in America. We get to live here, the freedom we have, the education we can receive, the resources we have, the wealth that we have, the technology that we have. You could FaceTime, like you could leave right now and be like, oh, you know what, Jeremy, I gotta take like a five minute break. I need to FaceTime my cousin who's in India right now. And you could see your cousin in India in a matter of seconds, halfway across the world. Can you believe the technology? You're like, your eyes are glazed over. You're like, yeah, I mean, come on, we've had that. We didn't have that like 25 years ago, right? Your parents and grandparents, they're like, yeah, what is that? Like they didn't know that 25 years ago. We have that now. You could fly to Europe in one day. Like in like 10 hours, like you could be in England. Can you believe that? What would the pilgrims think about that? Like that's unbelievable, right? That we could do that. You could get on Google Earth right now and you could see an aerial view of the Great Wall of China. You ever think about going to see the Great Wall of China? Maybe a few of you, most of you are like, no, but you could. You could get on Google Earth and you could see the Great Wall of China right now. They probably have live cameras that you could actually see what's literally happening right now on the Great Wall of China. Chat GPT can do your job for you now. You don't even have to work anymore, right? Just type the right prompts in and it'll work for you. It's unbelievable the time we get to live in the blessings that God has given to us. And then let's go out one more circle. Personal blessings that are just very specific to you. The gifts that God has given to you, the abilities God has given you, the education he's given you, the insights, the relationships that he has blessed you with. Do you ever just take a few minutes and like write these things down? Or some of you, you don't like to journal, write things down. Do you ever just sit there and for a while just say, God, thank you for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for this that you've given to me. Do you ever pray about them? Do you ever talk about them with with your family or with your friends? We are so blessed. God is so good to us in every way. And sometimes you just gotta let it overwhelm you. Just, just let it take you, let it move you, let, let it bring a, 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 a tear to your eye or just joy to your heart and just say, thank you, God, I'm overwhelmed by your goodness. Because this, gratitude kills superiority. Gratitude absolutely kills a sense of superiority, but it fuels engagement with God's mission. Gratitude kills superiority, but it fuels engagement with God's mission, with being a part of what God is doing. Because you're just like, thank you, God, that you've done all of this. Thank you for what I do get. Now let's go. Let's do something with what you've given to me. God, what else are you going to do? Um, I was on a plane recently, maybe a couple of, of months ago. I was actually going down on a flight to Orlando. And I don't know about you, but when I fly on a plane, um, I'm kind of like, Jeremy, be nice, be kind to people, but I'm not really like, hey, let's get into a two-hour conversation, right? You know, I'm kind of like looking for the earbuds to come out, and we'll say hi, and where are you from? If you're flying to Des Moines, inevitably you know the person that you're sitting next to, or they know your cousin, you know, so you kind of got to do that thing. And, but I also, at times, will pray, God, you know, if there's somebody here, just help me to be, just help me to be open. Help me to, help me to be open to what you're doing, the person you're putting next to me and, and available and open to that. And so a couple of months ago, I was flying down to Orlando and uh, I was in an exit row and there was a seat in between me and there was a guy that sat on the other side or on the aisle and I was sitting next to the window and it was one of those like, oh, hey, it's going, do you live in Orlando or, or are you from Des Moines? And yeah, we live in Orlando now. It's like, oh, what, you know, what, what, are, you, what are you back here for? And he goes, I, I actually was going to the funeral of my twin brother who committed suicide. And so it's him and his wife was sitting on the other aisle, a very young couple. And so, you know, I was like, okay, well, see you later. No, I didn't, right? You know, like somebody shares that with you, like, okay, God, all right, I guess this is maybe a convo if he wants to have one. And so just kind of open to that. Like, okay, well, uh, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry to hear about that. You know, like, tell me, tell me about your brother. What, you know, what was that like? And where, where's your family from? And kind of what happened? And so he just kind of shared that story with me. And we exchanged numbers. And I told him that I would pray for him. And 
I asked him about his kind of spiritual journey. I was like, do you, you know, do you go to church anywhere? Is that, is that kind of a part of your life? He's like, yeah, we are kind of grown up. We kind of did, but we, we haven't really known. We moved on to Orlando, but you know, we, we need to. We probably should do that. And I was like, yeah, we, we probably, should, probably should do that. That might, be, that might be helpful. And so we just had a conversation for a little while, and I told him I'd pray for him. And like I said, we exchanged numbers, and, and maybe a few weeks later, I texted him and said, hey, man, I'm just praying for you, praying for your family. I know your family's in the area. If they need anything, just you can give my number and love to help them and encourage them a little bit. You just don't know. I've had other flights that I've gone on where it's just like the earbuds go in immediately and you get the vibe, don't talk to me at all. And so that happens sometimes, I don't know. But, but can we just be open? Can we just be available? Thankful for the privilege God's given us to be able to fly in a plane and be halfway around the United States in two hours? Right, that kind of privilege that God's given to us and say, well, maybe there's somebody here you want me to interact with. Something you want me to do in this moment. Let's be grateful for all that God has done for us and ready to go. Ready to go, ready to see people. Now one specific way we can do this, and this is the second thing I wanna bring to us, is that as we engage with people and we're a part of what God has done, we're grateful for what he's done and we're engaging with him, there's one other specific way that we're encouraged to do this from the text. And it's, it's, it's somewhat minute, but I think it's important. And so I'll say it like this. What we get to be a part of includes discerning people's objections to Christianity and offering a winsome response. Now you might be like, okay, Jeremy, where are, you, where are you getting that from? I'm not quite seeing that emerald that's in here. Well, this whole section of Romans chapter three is Paul responding to objections that people had with the gospel that he was presenting. So Paul takes time to articulate their objections and address them. Very similar to what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter three and verse 15 where he says this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and do it with respect. Now, this doesn't mean that every single person here is a follower of Jesus, that you're a Bible scholar, that you're what we call a Christian apologist, you know all of the deep intellectual arguments and you can can kind of, you know, really go go, go with somebody in a high level conversation. But you notice what what Peter says, uh, share with them the reason for the hope that you have for the joy that God's given you, for the life that he's given you, your testimony and what God's done in you, share about that hope with people. And I think that's part of what Paul is doing here. He's trying to address those hangups that people have, those issues that they have with the gospel that he's sharing. He's trying to identify them and to answer those. Now the basic objections that Paul addresses here in Romans three, they're still very relevant today. It's like if God planned all of this Old Testament stuff, this Jewish nation stuff, isn't it his fault? He didn't work out, it didn't work out. I mean, if he knew that Adam would sin and he still created Adam, (coughs) why did he create him in the first place? And how can he judge Adam if he knew that was gonna happen? He knew we would be like this, right? Jeremy, you said we're all unrighteous. Paul says we're all unrighteous. He knew we're gonna be unrighteous, so isn't that God's fault? And if he knew that our sin would actually be a part of his plan, why are we getting judged for it? You ever ask questions like that? If you didn't before, you do now, right? I've tried to say them enough times, right? Like, yeah, these are legitimate questions, probably some form of those questions you've asked before. And so aren't you glad that God doesn't ignore them, but he gives time for them? That God through Paul articulates the kinds of questions that you have and that I have, the struggles that we have about why God is doing what he is doing, and he gives us space to process them and think about them. And not just these questions, but other questions too. My point is this, God gives space for your questions. He gives space for your doubts and for your objections. One of the biggest objections we get in the Bible that I'm still relatively uncomfortable with is one of the Psalms where the psalmist says this, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long, God, are you gonna hide your face from me? That's in the Bible. Like, can, you, can you talk to God like that? Are you allowed to say those kinds of things to God? Apparently you can because it's in the Bible. It's in a Psalm of scripture and so God gives space for that kind of sorrow and grief and struggle and questions that we have. Paul, he's engaging with some serious pushback here and he wants to address those questions and lead people to belief. And he doesn't help to lead people to belief by dismissing the questions that they have or acting like they're foolish or they're stupid questions. I mean, he even starts to feel a little bit like, hey, I'm using a human argument when I say this. I don't really believe this. And I've been accused of this. And I know this is, sounds a little ridiculous, but let's address it because it's a legitimate question that people have. So he doesn't dismiss concerns. He also doesn't give weak answers. We do this sometimes. 
Like we take our opponents or somebody's opposition they have and we take the worst and the uh, weakest part of their argument and then we act like that's the whole argument. Stop doing that. Don't just forget the weak side of their argument. State their argument or the objection they have better than they can. Try to really understand it. Add to the weight of their doubts, the weight of their objection that they have and, and then let's try to Then let's try to tackle it. That's what Paul does. He engages very seriously with the objections and the doubts. Now I'll say this one more time. First of all, God does this for us. We have that throughout scriptures. And then second, Paul shows us what this can look like for us to do this for others. He reminds us to have a sensitivity to people's hangups, their doubts, their objections as we engage others with the gospel. And so I just ask you, you know, you have neighbors, um, you have friends, you have classmates, you have coworkers, family members that have concerns, that have objections that keep them from believing in Jesus. What are they? Have you thought about that sometimes? What are those hangups? Maybe they've been verbally stated. Maybe they haven't. And you just get a sense, I think this is keeping them from believing in Jesus. And you just have a discernment and a sense about it. How might you learn about them? How might you think about them and perhaps engage those individuals with the objections that they have or even open a door to conversation? Do you know, this is a way of seeing people. It's a way of loving them, taking them seriously and processing and learning and growing yourself in that. You you know this is true. Um, A lot of times when we begin to engage people, maybe with the objections or a different point of view that they have, we end up learning a whole lot more about ourselves and what we believe. Like, you know this is true. Uh, for some of you, for instance, maybe you've like never had to cook in your life. You don't make the meals, you've never had to do that. But then maybe you're in a situation where maybe your spouse is away, or maybe you had a, a roommate that did all the cooking and that person's away, or, um, or maybe you grow up and you're done with your education or whatever and you gotta do your own career and you're like, I don't know how to cook. You know what happens? In that moment when your, your stomach is growling and mom or dad or whoever cooked is not around anymore, you know what? You figure out how to cook, don't you? Because the pressure is on, it's your real life situation now and you're like, we do have this thing called the internet and probably 18 million cookbooks out there so we can watch a network about how to cook and we can get books and I can learn. And you're motivated, you're motivated to learn them. Some of you with driving, you know, this, this is true up till in Iowa to the time you're about 14 years old. You have no idea how to get to your house. You don't know where your school is. You can like know where it is. You don't know how to get there. You don't know how to get to Donut Land. Have you been to Donut Land yet? You need to learn how to get to Donut Land, how you get to that place, right? And so you don't know and you start driving and then your kid gets their license and you're like, I, I hope you're going to make it to the place you're going to. Again, we have these phones now and they tell you how to get there, right? But until you're motivated, until it's on your plate, a lot of times you don't know those things. The same thing is true with our faith. Sometimes other people's objections drive us to to come to know and understand what we actually believe when we have to investigate for ourselves. Now as you consider your friends, your coworkers, your classmates hang ups with Christianity, and you begin thinking about how how do I open a door, how do I address those things with them? Realize three things real quick. First of all, some people simply have misconceptions about Christianity. You probably have a number of people in your life that think certain things are true about Christianity that if you could just get into a conversation with them about those, you could say to them, I don't think that either. We don't, we don't actually believe that either. That's a misconception. And a lot of times you'll find in a conversation that people have all sorts of weird ideas about what Christians believe that we don't actually believe. And so part of it is you could just say, I don't, I don't think that's true either. I, don't, I wouldn't be that adamant about that, that thing either. That's not nearly as important as maybe you think it is. A second level is that other people have legitimate intellectual questions. They have really serious intellectual questions with, with, with Christianity. Maybe questions about origins or questions about the end of life or questions about judgment or questions about supposed rules within Christianity, right? And these are serious intellectual questions that sometimes we need to process with them and have conversations about. But then realize there's a third thing here that often and typically I think is going on is that a lot of people actually have experienced rejection or hurt by religion or by someone that was a religious person. And so showing them love and understanding goes a long way. Maybe, uh, for instance, uh, somebody that in their life had an abusive person in their life that was also very religious. You know, if you have a person in your life that is very religious and they're abusive towards you, you're probably not gonna look very kindly on religion, are you? And there's a lot of people in our world that fall into that kind of category. They've been hurt in some way by a person or by religion. And so talking with them and engaging in relationship goes a long way. 
Who's in your sphere of influence? Who can you love? Who can you see? Who could you engage with? Maybe start with one person. Maybe start with one person and pray for them. Pray for insight. Pray pray for wisdom. Pray for an open door. Pray for how to love them and engage with them and be proactive. Take a step towards them. Now, I think that all of us can do this. I think all of us can, can grow in this. I think we have the capacity through God and through his spirit to be able to engage with people and to meet them where they're at. But some of you, you're really, really wired for this. And so can I recommend a, a couple of resources for us today and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. The two books that I think are the best for this at a popular level are both by Rebecca McLaughlin. She's written a book, Confronting Christianity. That's a little bit more for adults. She has one for teenagers, 10 questions every teen should ask and answer about Christianity. We have these in our bookstore. You could get them on Amazon as well if you wanted to do. But if you want to go a little deeper in your faith, why do you believe what you believe? Are you specifically engaging with somebody who has some of these hangups about Christianity? These would be great books. They're very accessible to be able to read. I'd encourage you to grab them. Church, uh, let's go. I'm grateful to Jesus for everything he is, all of the blessings he brings, embracing our role and what we get to be a part of, seeing people, loving them, engaging with their concerns and leading them to Jesus. Who is he putting on your mind right now? Who maybe is coming into your heart and you're saying, I think maybe I could, I could take a step towards that person. I could maybe get to know them a little bit more. I could maybe invite them into a conversation. I could maybe do something for them. Colleague, family member, classmate, a friend. Would you pray for them right now?